Um, okay, great. We'll get started. Thank you all um, for coming and um, welcome to our panel discussion um, hosted by uh, literary managers and dramaturgs of the Americas. And uh, we're here at the Castillo Theater and All Stars Project, way west on 48th Street. So we thank them um, for hosting us in this great space. Um, the impetus for this conversation um, comes from a lot of different places. Most recently, um, a bit of a controversy over um, the recent Encores production of a Big River and um, a conversation that developed between um, a journalist and a producer that mostly happened over social media. And so one of the things that we thought would be great is that since we are a theater community and one of the things we celebrate is being in a room together and being um, the same air and talking about and debating um, different topics, mostly through plays, but also around plays, that why don't we try to convene a conversation, but also broaden the discussion um, to include uh, other ways in which um, unconscious bias might play out in the work that we do, um, and how we can sometimes, even in a, a theater community where we pride ourselves on talking and listening to one another, where we have blind spots, and what uh, is the work that can remain to be done. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to my co-moderator, Dean Tran, um, who's associate editor at American Theatre Magazine um, and a journalist, and has been leading lots of conversations about equity, diversity, and inclusion to introduce our panelists and lay some ground rules for our, our discussion today. Right, we're going to have this mic a bit. I don't think it's on. It is on. Just hold it. Yeah. Good. Yeah, it's just very understanding. Um, I think we're jacked. <laughs> yeah? Oh, no, no, for, the, for the people on Powell. Oh, I thought that's for the people on Powell. I don't know. I should stop asking questions. All right, we're going to tag team this. It's going to be awesome. So, first off, let, well, we go down the row and you can introduce yourselves. Um, do you want to start? Absolutely. Um, my name is Jesse Cameron Alec. Um, um, hi, Jesse Cameron Alec, and I'm the literary manager at the Public Theater. Hi, I'm Victoria Myers, and I am editor of The Interval. I'm Howard Sherman. I'm the director of the Arts Integrity Initiative at the New School for Drama, and I'm also the U.S. columnist for the Stage Newspaper in London. <laughs> for certain publication. Um, and first of all, I just wanted to set some, I don't want to say ground rules, but just some guidance for the discussion. Uh, I, like to quote, I like to quote Taylor Mack by saying, everything you're feeling is appropriate. <laughs> so if you feel uncomfortable, that is okay. That is the point. And do not be afraid to you know, speak candidly and to maybe offend some people. And if we can just make this a safe space for discussion, then we'll hopefully get to some really, you know, valuable insight. So, do we want, Ken, do you want to? Sure. Yeah. Let me uh, take your mic, and Laura, hold on to yours, and I'll start with you. Um, There's like the questions all over again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Laura, we don't want to necessarily rehash um, what you went through, but I'm, I know I'm, I'm curious about your approach to the job. So what happened when you, you know, got this gig that you're going to be reviewing this? And can you tell us a little bit about like how you dove in? One of the things that, you know, we're interested in as uh, drama terms is about the context. Like what context are we going to be in? Why this play and this place at this time? These are the questions that we're very interested in as uh, theater makers and share a lot of interest and traits with theater critics. We're just working on like different sides of opening night, right? Um, so I just want to hear more of your you know, personal experience diving in, obviously not knowing that your review is going to um, you know, light a fire, but also having something to say based on your research and experience watching the play. Right, but um, I did start out with research. I did start out by going to the library. I Watched, I'd already seen the Death Mouse production. I did go, you may have read this and you did not my editors. So, <laughs> whatever. Um, I went to 
performing arts library, I watched the original Broadway production on DVD, and then I cracked open one of those binders that has season's reviews in them, and I read all of the reviews of Big River. The critics were not thrilled, they were just grateful that something good at the end of the season had finally, not good, but not bad and long. <laughs> they were, they were like breathing a sigh of relief. Um, but the thing about, I mean you know this, the thing about theater is that you don't know what it's going to be until you walk in the room and it starts happening in front of you in the same, you know, in the air that you're breathing, in the culture you're living in, and you can't go into that. I didn't, I couldn't possibly know that what I was going to say would light a fire because I had no idea what I was going to say. And even the next morning, and because it was, you know, such a short run, and it was the next morning that I was smiling, it was only when I couldn't possibly ignore the feeling that I had that I knew that I was going to write about that. So, and I think actually what I wrote was pretty mild and not groundbreaking whatsoever, and I think the entire thing is insane. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you feel when you go to a show that you have any responsibility to support the theater? I mean, various critics have, no. have talked about, well, what, what's my job? What's my job? And you know, we don't have necessarily lots of conversations about critics. We read the criticism, we read the reviews, but not necessarily the process of going about it. And and what do you think your job is when you're going to see a show and you're going to review it? Well, support is a verb that you guys use, <laughs> and I understand that. And it's just not one that we use about you know the reason that we're there. We're all part of the same ecosystem. I just don't think that our job is um, support. Your boss, in fact, Oscar, um, something he said that stuck in my head about like, you know, we're there to hold each other to account. And I think that's absolutely true. Everybody in that ecosystem is. Um, so support is good, holding each other to account is also good. Um, I think that's a good segue to include Jesse into the conversation. Um, <laughs> uh, can you tell us a little bit about your responsibilities at, at the public and how um, you engage questions about what to produce and when? Yes, I sure can. Um, uh, so I'm a literary manager, and that essentially means I read plays and I uh, see plays and I travel um, quite a little bit and I see plays, and then essentially I just have conversations with playwrights and get drunk with them and figure out you know what they're interested in and what we're interested in public theater and try and find that intersection between the two. Um, and then that's and then at the public theater there's lots of other duties um, as a sign. Um, the public theater is an interesting um, theater to be on this panel because I think that we all may be an outlier um, in terms of like what plays to produce when um, because someone once told me oh it doesn't feel like it's a question of the public theater it just sort of happens which is like a lovely thing to say that it's just not true. It is the question of the public theater constantly, all the time. And it's my job to bring up that question. I, or I take it as my job to bring up that question. I think it's of the most importance. That, that was very efficient. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what do you find right now in your job as literary manager at, at the public theater, which has a lot of attention, right? A lot of things that happen in the public get covered. Some go on to, to various things. There's it, it's such a big producing entity. Um, do you feel that there are particular challenges in your job or at, at the public theater with regard to engaging the audience at the particular cultural moment? I mean, you said you were an outlier, but like, there have got to be challenges with that. There's absolutely challenges. Um, uh, I mean, one challenge I can give you is actually a technical um, challenge, which is that, um, uh, like every theater, we set a season about a year in advance. You know, we, we announce a season about a, um, a year in advance, and we're start, we're thinking about a season a year and a half, two years in advance. We're, we're commissioning projects, you know, that have a very long arc. So how do you land a project in the right year, and how do you not work on a project for too long so that the cultural moment has passed? Um, which I think often happens. I think that's tricky. Um, and then in terms of like, I think there's also the question of wanting to do work about an issue or a community 
or something that's happening um, and someone writes a play, then that's great, and they give it to you, but it presents a point of view that may not be helpful for society at this moment. I think that can be really tricky. And what happens when that does happen? When you present a particular play with a particular point of view that's not helpful when you work in an institution like the public. We, right? we try we try to make sure that doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I do that. I mean, sometimes like when you're producing theater, you don't necessarily know how it's gonna land until it lands. I mean, that's true, but one of our jobs um, is, is to predict the future. Um, and, um, and, I mean like I think that you can like look at a piece. Um, uh, I'll just take something on my mind. Um, right now, I won't, I'll erase all the names um, that I'm innocent, but there's, a, um, there's a, actually a few plays out there um, there about Islam, um, and I think that's a really important thing to have on stage. Um, and, and there's a number of plays that have been landing on my desk that are about Islam. They're really, really good plays. They're well written, and they take the point of view um, of examining Islam from the feminist point of view and how um, uh, Muslim women are treated poorly and beaten and raped and forced over and stuff um, uh, in Islamic countries. Is that the right thing to do right now? I'm not, I'm not gonna answer, but, but, but those sorts of questions um, uh, that kind of wrestle with. I mean, you have to take an opinion, you have to take a stance. Great, we're still waiting on another panelist, but do you have uh, questions for the two that are here? Okay, um, let's see, is this for Howard? So, uh, Howard, you, you were up there until recently the interim director of the um, Arts Alliance. It's like on some inclusion in the arts, yes. And in, in that work, like you've been doing a lot of um, writing about race and gender issues within the theater and also censorship. And so when you're writing, how do you uh, how do you know to uh, I guess how do you acknowledge and avoid biases and how do you make sure that you're covering it fairly? All I can write from is my beliefs, and I've never pretended to be impartial. I write with bias, the bias being what I believe would be the best perspective, the best practices in the field, and what is what I understand to be the best way to move the field towards inclusion and equity. I am a middle-aged, heterosexual, cisgendered Jewish man. I cannot pretend to write from any other perspective than that. I hope that I have sufficient knowledge and empathy that I can use my experience and my privilege to support leaving the theater a better place than I found it when I started. Like a good boy scout. <laughs> Um, so, so it's it's an internal compass. I have people that I sometimes will show my writing to before I show it to the world on either of the sites that I write on regularly or for the stage. Um, and I just try to think about: is there something that I can say that somebody else can't say, or is there something I can say that I haven't seen? Think maybe it's worth saying. And like, well, why do you think it's? I mean, just just for people who don't quite understand, like, why we do this kind of work. But like, why do you think it's important to like use the microphone that you have to give awareness to these issues? I think there's a historic inequity in theater. I don't even want to generalize broadly to the arts because. My, my deepest knowledge has been in the theater. Um, I had come up in the American Regional Theater Movement. It started really in the mid-60s. I started working professionally in the mid-80s. Um, and I've come to understand that 
frankly, probably things even that I did or was part of in the early years of my career um, were opportunities that were denied or that may have, in fact, denied opportunities to others. And so I just think it's important that we're conscious of it all. Um, and as I say, to whatever degree I've been given a voice, either by virtue of the jobs I've had, the, my ability to communicate, or simply my own compulsion to tell people what I think, um, I'm going to do that. And if it resonates with people, that's great. And I've had people who tell me they appreciate writing. And in my all-time favorite quote, um, uh, a magazine journalist in Canada wrote, Howard Sherman's anti-racism is worse than racism itself. <laughs> so, you know, but I just I just have to go with, with my gut. And I suppose if if I was wildly off base, uh, I'd be called on it. And I have been by some people, and that's fine. And again, that hopefully I'm listening. I mean, I've had the opportunity through this work to meet an enormous number of artists that I may not have encountered personally otherwise um, by choosing to be an ally about, on issues of, of race uh, and gender and disability. Um, and and I, I want to acknowledge disability particularly because when we talk about diversity, we, we often think about uh, race and ethnicity, we think about gender, uh, disability is too often left out of the country. Uh, it's important that it be there as well. Well, and class too. Well, divers, there's so much. There's so much. Um, oh, we have a latecomer. Do um, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, <laughs> uh, sorry. I'm Michael McElroy. I'm an actor. I'm actually a teacher at my I'm sorry, I was late because I was teaching class. Um, and I'm glad to be here. Right. Well, since you have the microphone, we don't want to make it a logistical <laughs> nightmare again. Uh, I have some questions for you. Sure. Yeah. So when it, and the reason we asked you to be here was because you were in a production of Big River. Yes. And so how did you react when all of the things went down? Well, um, I actually uh, don't read reviews, so um, that's been a long-standing uh, choice. But I was at work, and I got an email from a coworker, a different uh, faculty member, saying, did you see what happened in the reviews and things for the city center in Big River? And I said, no. So he sent them to me. And um, I read the review, and then I read the response. And I was um, really taken back by the response to the review, which I thought was valid. Uh, I did the 2003 production of Big River, which was the Deaf West production. Um, up until that point, I had never done a production of Big River. I had no desire to do a production of Big River. Um, and the only reason I auditioned for this production was because uh, it was being done with deaf and hearing actors. And because of how it was being done, it illuminated, it opened up the story in a different way. It redefined what this uh, African-American slave, who he was, because he also spoke, he was a fluent in sign language. It opened up what the idea of otherness was because of the deaf and the hearing actors that shared the stage. But I never had any desire to do it uh, before that or since because I think, uh, and this is my own personal opinion, as a man of color, I don't, I don't uh, want to put myself in a situation where I'm being treated in such a way that feels a little too close to how I can be treated in today's world. Um, I'm not interested in being called a nigger uh, eight times a week. Um, it does something as actors. We are taught to leave the show behind when you leave the stage door, but some of that stuff you carry around. And I was not interested in being a part of that story. Um, so when I read the review, I thought, hmm, that's very interesting to question in this moment in time where we are as a nation what responsibility we have, do we have to tell them that story at this time? And it's not that it shouldn't be told, but if we're going to tell it, I always, I, I'm pretty passionate about the fact that it should be, um, there should be some kind of conversation around it, so that it's not like it's just 
we're putting this out there because it's here and because it was written in 1984. We have no responsibility about it. I think there's a huge responsibility in this day and age when, we're, when the country is going through what we're going through as a group of people uh, in terms of race and how we uh, deal and talk with each other and exist together, that to put that on stage um, and not have a conversation to me felt slightly irresponsible. Um, and that's my opinion. Uh, and I just feel that uh, with those kinds of pieces and we can stand behind the idea of this is a work of great fiction, but then I question to whom? It's not to me. I mean, I'm, I have nothing against Mark Twain, but to once again have my voice or the voice of people who look like me told through one person's perspective, it's always in a limited way, is, makes me question what it means to me. Um, and if it, if it is a work of great, a great work to me. Um, so I was very taken back by the response to that and wanted to talk about it. Wanted to say, you know, I agree that in this time we need to have more conversations. It's not that we have to agree. We've gotten so on each, on opposite sides that we don't even take the time to have a conversation. Not that we have to ever agree on anything. But there should be enough humanity that we have for each other that we should be able to talk about and at least frame why this is considered a work of art and what it means in 2017 to present this work of art uh, to the public. Um, I think that that furthers conversation as opposed to just saying, well, this was written in 1984, it's worth, based on this great piece of work, and here it is. I, I think that we can do so much more with our art, and we have to do that much more with our art today. Um, we have, a, I think, a huge responsibility to be able to kind of change the conversation, to create conversation, to, um, to uh, invite people from all different backgrounds to be able to kind of come together and learn something through our art. So that's my two cents on that. I have so many questions about that. That was awesome. But we have to move on yes. to our final panelist, uh, Victoria. And so we're just flip, switching gears a little bit from race to gender. Um, do you want to tell me a little bit about um, the the debate when you read Little Nels' Sweet Charity Review and how it led to the great essay that you wrote for the Intervolt? Um, sure. So in December, um, Little Nails went and reviewed Sweet Charity and wrote a review of it um, that I thought was remarkable in both the depth and breadth of the sexism that was presented in it. Um, and at the interval, we've been talking for a while about doing a study about sexism and abuse that Danielle, who was right over there, um, is in charge of and has been working very hard on. Because it's something that comes up a lot. We do a lot of interviews, it's like 90% of our content. And something that comes up a lot is women feeling like their work isn't taken seriously or there's very gender language used in the reviews. Um, it's very subtle, but it's there. Or for the actresses, that their bodies are talked about in a way that feels inappropriate, over the top, and it's not happening to um, their male counterparts. And so this particular review was very extreme, um, both in the sense that it kind of, in my opinion, met a lot of criteria of what sexism is, both in terms of the language used and also the framework in which it was presenting information, and the fact that it didn't particularly engage with the material. It was more just making broad statements about Lee Silverman as a director and saying that she took her work too seriously, which I think most people would actually say is a compliment and something that you would never say to a man. Um, and it just seemed like a very good case study to use of here's a review Let's go through and explore how it's sexist. Um, so I went through, and first I went back and read a bunch of his old, or, uh, other reviews. And to be fair to him, there are reviews that he written or shows by women where there is no sexism whatsoever. That wasn't the case in this one, and it wasn't the case in many other reviews as well. Um, and I kind of specifically looked at it because he was so fixated on the fact that, like, oh, she's too serious, and it makes her work bad. It's like, well, has he ever called a male director's work too serious? especially in musical, um, which he hadn't. So kind of using that to show actually like the very stark contrast in how work by women and work by men is talked about in the press. Um, so 
So that's kind of the very, very short version. It was, you know, it was an interesting experience to do. Um, luckily, we had like a very, very positive reaction to it. It actually became our most read piece ever. And I think hopefully it started a lot of discussion. We thought it is such a bigger discussion than just about a review to charity. Um, because I think there have been many other examples of sexism in reviews. And I think this one's very extreme, but by far not the only one. Um, and hopefully, you know, now people will be a little bit more aware of it because I think one of the problems is that for so long, you know, like people maybe like put an angry Facebook status up or they like angry tweeted about something. But unless you're actually like writing to the editor of the publication and being like, hey, this is wrong, let me tell you why I think it's wrong, I think it gives them, um, it makes it very easy for to ignore. And I think one of the things that's good to be more proactive about is kind of like, if you see something, say something. Um, and you know, write to the editors. Like, fine, they probably won't answer, but if we're all calling our senators now anyway. <laughs> so if you see something, I think it's like, okay, become that person. It's just like, hi, me again. This is sexist, this is why. Because there are certainly like other reviewers that I'm sure you many of us can name who have had an experience of saying not great things about women and not great things about other minorities. And, you know, unless you say something, they have no reason to change what they're doing because there are no consequences. Right, so very quickly, did Hilton ever respond? No, um, the only response that there ever was is the New Yorker, I want to say like two months later, like quite a bit after the fact, published one letter about <laughs> oh, so but let's go into the, um, the conversation portion among the panelists. Uh, Ken, do you want to start us off? Maybe it's, maybe it's like the other microphone so we can get it working. So have some more flexibility here. Um, yes, just speak louder. Yes. We had a lot of threads that we could um, pull on. I think the one I want to start with is something that you know the, the Marco Victoria were both saying that it's important to continue the conversation or to have venues in which we can continue the conversation. If you see something, say something. I think with uh, you know websites and social media, people can say things fairly quickly um, and, and put them out there. Um, sometimes they um, stir up conversation or at least more potentially one-sided statements. Um, and is that really a conversation? Um, so one of the things I'm, I'm interested in, in this idea of see something, say something, what are the parameters under which you can have those conversations, particularly when they're difficult? Are there certain conversations about representation of any kind of minority or disadvantaged status, and we all have them in one degree, or, or maybe not if we call them out, but um, can express you know, being in some position of privilege or another position of feeling under somebody's foot. And sometimes when we have difficult things to say, um, we find allies with which to have those conversations. How can those conversations extend then beyond those groups of allies, and so to, to produce a kind of meaningful conversation. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the barriers we put up is those people who are making theater, those people who are reviewing theater. How do we have more conversations after the show opens, after the review comes out, to keep a conversation going? Because um, a lot of times, as we've talked about already, reviews can bring up some questions that maybe weren't asked. Um, and then maybe do need to be discussed. How do, how do we keep that going? So the first question I'll throw out to the, the panel with respect to that is, where are the times for you personally are conversations about difference the most challenging to bring up? Where do you feel most silenced? I think conversations about difference. Yeah, conversations about difference. To bring up a difficult conversation about representation <laughs> of whatever class, you know, 
you want to talk about. Do you mean internally or like where we've met the most resistance and actually having that? I think both. both. You know, do you find yourself sometimes wanting to say something and not saying it? Or having said something and finding you put your, your foot in it in a kind of way? I'll jump in over. I actually have one. <laughs> Um, because this is actually both things, is for me, the thing that I'm kind of most ashamed of myself about, turning a blind eye to, is like, I definitely have people say anti-Semitic things to me in interviews, and I've definitely seen it out there in general, and I find that that's a very hard thing to bring up. I think that's true for Jews, um, in the country at this moment, especially because we like to pretend that anti-Semitism only exists on the right, and that's just not true. Um, it's across party lines. And the way that it manifests itself sometimes in liberal circles is very difficult. And in the Tutorial Review, one of the things that I brought up as a question is that there was some anti-Semitism at play because of the nature in which he was attacking Lee Silverman, who was obviously a Jewish woman. And there had been some other reviews also concerning Jews that had a similar sort of tone. And it was funny, that was a thing that people had trouble with in a way that even if they disagreed with the sexism, I mean, obviously there are a few people who are like, we should go to hell. Um, but there's a funny way that anti-Semitism being raised, there was a question that they were like, that is completely inappropriate to bring up. And that means that this entire piece has no validity whatsoever. And it's also mostly coming from Christians. And it's just like, in today's world, where we're so, or well, where liberals are trying to be so conscious of not like mansplaining or any of those other terms, um, that people would feel so entitled to tell somebody Jewish, no, no, there's no anti-Semitism there, and you're completely wrong for bringing it up, even though I can't support anything that I'm saying, and even though it was like two sentences in this entire piece, and I found that very disturbing. I'm going to follow up on that a little bit. Do you feel like it's, um, I want to talk about responsibility, do you feel like it's your responsibility as someone who um, maybe shares in a target of something to speak up, um, and how is that different from recognizing um, bigotry in an area in which you don't necessarily identify? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. So bringing up something that, you know, uh, calling out anti-Semitism, is that the job of Jews? Oh, there's yeah. everyone? I mean, I think it's like the ideal world versus the actual world, where it's like, most logically, a person who is most affected by it is going to be the first person to bring it up. Um, I, you know, I have some Christian friends who I've talked about this a lot and who, you know, I think are great. I hesitate to ever use the word ally because I think there's like a note of condescension in that. Um, I think it's kind of like, just don't do it. Like, either do the thing or don't do the thing. Like, do the right thing, do the wrong thing. But like, Pick something with your actions behind it rather than necessarily like doing something that's going to give you a lot of likes on Facebook. Um, I mean, I think I don't want to speak for all Jews here. Um, but yeah, I feel like there's probably an internal pressure that's different when you're the person who feels it most personally. Um, but I don't necessarily think that's even. I don't know. I don't necessarily just see it as a bad thing, always. I mean, like, it's just part of the package. Sure. Let me bring it back to um, our roles in um, working in the theater, um, producing, creating theater, working as artists in theater, writing about theater. Um, do we have any fundamental responsibilities when we work on something, when we write about something, to look at cultural representation and to, and to ask those questions about um, whose stories are we telling and whose stories, who's telling the stories, um, who can tell the stories, who should be engaged with the stories, who's missing at the table. I think that's a really great question, but, um, it, um, uh, but it, it depends upon what your mission is. 
Um, listen, if your mission is to make commercial theater that everyone can dance to and like pay $100 a ticket, um, uh, and that's your mission, then no, of course you don't. Who cares about representation? Who cares about like um, anything? And like this. I'm sorry. I'm saying if you can sell tickets, so I'm just talking about, you know, I'm, I'm talking about like the commercial theater that I just has right now. Um, but they don't have to, you know, their, their goal is to sell tickets. Um, so um, you take this Encores um, um, thing, I, I don't pretend to know what the, you know, what the mission of Encores is or anything like that. If their goal was to make um, a splashy, cool production of a Big River that does not, um, you know, sort of consider, you know, the 21st century and Trump and everything like that, if that was their goal, then they achieved it. But of course, if that's their goal, pointing out the, the flaws in the context of the 21st century, and they shouldn't be complaining about it, you know, frankly. Um, uh, I got a little off track. It's an interesting sort of thing of uh, what our responsibility is, um, because um, I think I'd actually have to split it, um, my professional responsibility versus my personal responsibility. Oh, yeah, um, so. um, because like, in terms of like my professional responsibility, I work with public theater. I mean, representation is the thing. Um, and um, and um, any time I come up against anything, you know, I mean, with uh, any sort of one of the one of the phobias, one of the awful um, sort of things um, in the world, of course I'll rise up against it, you know, because that, you know, that's just morally where I, where I go. But if it's like, you know, I was in San Francisco on uh, Saturday night at a, at a house party, um, and um, oh, some really really liberal person um, uh, um, uh, um, started dissing me for like an Obama and called me a neoliberal and told me that was a bad black person. And um, and, um, and she was um, a, a white person. Um, and I, and I, I considered, I was just like, I'm not going to have this conversation. I'm not going to go there. You know, that's not what I'm going to do. And I think that's an okay thing to do, to, do, to choose. You know? um, although I will say um, uh, that was cowardly of me. You know? um, I think it's cowardly when you decide not to take a fight. I was drunk and I decided not to fight. Um, and that is cowardly. I should have you know, sobered up and had that argument because it makes the world better. Um, Lori had some response to one of the claims um, that Jesse made. Um, no, actually, I just, my more immediate response is how interesting that drunk we did not fight. <laughs> 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 um, no, I just, um, you said everyone, and I mean, I, I'm thinking of producers, not individual producers, but as a group, I mean, you should be thinking of everyone, because, anyway, this program has this thing that uh, it's not program like, you know, on gender lines, like 50-50 each production, it's the balance of an entire season, or it's a balance of like, over five years, is it 50%? And if you think about all of the different ways that you can represent diversity, you know, like achieving a balance in a cycle makes so much more sense than keeping track every time. But I do think that there is a responsibility thing for critics to, I mean, I, I keep score, I do, I count, I notice, you know, who's represented and who's not, and how can you not? Um, and I do think that that's a responsibility for everybody in the ecosystem, because they don't. Oh, I'm just gonna say, it's, it's like I, I don't wanna just totally be out of this uh, city center because uh, I did a, a, a concert version in October of something with Michael George did. And we have since moved to Broadway uh, for a short run. But if you look at the cast, it has representation of many different uh, backgrounds. And it's not about race. Race doesn't come into play at all. And that to me is the ultimate, where it's you know the best people that they thought of of an audition who had the talent and the skill to do the job were hired. You know I mean, so it wasn't about race. I'm very frustrated when I go to a Broadway show and I see an all-white cast where race is not an issue or part of the story. That you know, and we want to sit back and say, "Oh, Hamilton, oh, on your feet." But it's you see the most diversity when it's race-specific for people of color. But when you're talking about, and I think I can pretty much say Michael Bright is one of the few directors that when he does a show about New York City, it looks like New York City. And that's what, I feel like we've gotten somewhere when the most talented people get the jobs 
and, it, and that we don't, it's not based on this kind of keeping something one, all one color, because that's the easiest thing to do. Um, and, and so, just to say, the City Center has done both. I mean, I, I feel very strongly about the Big River, but I also have to say, that I'm able to come into a Sondheim show the third time it's been on Broadway, and it's the first time it's had two men of color in the show, of this, sh of this show. That's something that I wanted to be a part of, because who knows when that opportunity will come along again, when the producer will think, oh, I can just cast across the board the most talented people and not look at this specific composer and think, why don't they? All the question to that, do you find, um as a performer, when you're involved in a project that's been um, assembled um, with uh, a conscious diversity in mind to try to get a mix of, of people in the room, do you find that the artistic process is different? Well, I think it has to be because there are people coming from many different points of view in the room, and it, and it all it has to do with the creative team being open and available to have those conversations. Once again, those, those conversations are not always easy to have. We all struggle with how we say certain things and the content, but I think in a creative space, depending on the creative team, everyone, should, I think the more people you have and diverse backgrounds in the room, the more perspectives and the, and the more exciting to me the art is going to be because you have more opportunities for many different things that you might not think of given your own specific experience. So I find that those moments are exciting. Um, Howard, do you want to talk just a little bit about inclusion in the arts? Um, it's been around for 30 years, I'm trying to remember. Seven, I'm not sure which one I asked you about. Um, and it, would you talk a little bit about the advocacy and trying to get to this, to having diverse points of view in the room as often being fruitful to art making and, and addressing the issue that we're talking about today, which is how do we break out of our silos of comfort and engage with people who have different well, first of all, acknowledging that I've just finished my time with inclusion of the arts, so to me to, to fully represent them is not uh, You can just speak for yourself. Entirely. Yeah. Right. But, you know, some of what we, I mean, one of the, the focuses that we had over the past few years while I was there was, was we got involved in a lot of issues about, you know, about authentic representation which is that when you have a role that is written for a person of color, that it is played by a person of that color, that it is not casting white people in, uh, in Latinx roles. It's not about looking at a play set in India with characters with Southeast Asian names and casting white people in those roles. The, the, the challenge, and this goes back to when Inclusion of the Arts was, was known as the Non-Traditional Casting Project, which ultimately became a name that's a problematic name, it's worth pointing out, because it suggests that you have to go against tradition, and that tradition was white, so it, it moved away from that idea, but that you can't ignore race and ethnicity at this time. As, as Michael said, it would be great to reach the point where we don't have to think about that. And occasionally we see productions which manage to, albeit be color conscious, the whole concept of color blind is sort of out the window now, because you can't ignore it. You can't ignore it when a play calls for characters of color, you can't ignore it when a play doesn't call for characters of color, but you introduce actors of color. Um, but the idea that we take this historic inequity, which has so favored white European stories, um, and consciously work to open up the repertoire to allow other people into the process of telling those stories. We are a long way from having a sufficiently large literary repertory that then 
everybody, again, can play whatever roles come along. The problem is that the preparatory is still far too narrow. And so when there are discussions about, well, if people of color can play Jefferson and Washington and um, uh, Lafayette and so on, um, then why can't white people do August Wilson? Well, that's nonsense. The problem that August Wilson wrote this play specifically so that people of color could express their experience on stage. White people haven't had that problem. So right now the effort is to A, make sure that plays that do call for people of color are, are played by people of that race or ethnicity. And whenever possible, not to treat the, um, the cast of characters page of a script, which typically only mentions color when people aren't to be white, um, but to treat it as something that has more fluidity, even not just with race and ethnicity, but with gender, with disability so that there can be more variety of people who are allowed into the club of people who are allowed to be on stage. And that same effort has to be made for people backstage. And by backstage, I mean everybody, including director and choreographer, the producer, and so on. Because, because we're fighting against a very entrenched experience in American theater, um, which has not allowed it. Um, the other day, recently, uh, week ago or something, anyway, I did uh, an interview with Janae Benton, and she, it was just, I had a teeny tiny word count, so almost, we had this great conversation, almost nothing showed up, um, but like half an hour later, she texted me, because the subject of colorblind casting had come up, and she'd said then, she didn't like that term. But she texted me to tell me the term she preferred, which was white supremacist casting. <laughs> 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 that's my commodity indeed. But I, know I have a thousand questions and I could go on for three hours, but we have limited time, so Dee has a couple questions and then we'll open it up to get yours. Right. So I, I, I wanted to talk about just having conversations because like Laura and Victoria, like you call that something that you found was very problematic, but it seemed like the other party was open to having that kind of conversation. So when we're trying to have these very uncomfortable conversations with people who may not want to admit that there's a problem, and I've had this same issue on my end when I write about representation and yellow face and white people playing Asian people, then people get very pissed off at me by pointing out that there's a problem. So how do we break, I, I guess maybe, how do we get past that divide? Like how do we make them listen? I mean, on a certain level, I don't know, but I think some of the things that are important to at least acknowledge, and as part of that conversation, there are two things. One, which is the theater community can be really clicky, um, and I think that's something we kind of don't acknowledge. Like you see it as a community, but not talking about how like there are subgroups within that, and that a lot of conversations are limited to those subgroups. And if you don't know somebody in that group, then you're probably not even aware that conversation is happening. Um, so I think like that this is something to be aware of. Because like I remember when the first Kilroy list came out. But like I saw it all over Twitter, and I'm sure many people in this room saw it all over Twitter. But there were so many people who had no idea. And I'm talking about people who you would think would be like very interested. Like um, all of my actresses' friend, friends had no idea that it existed, and all of them were very interested to find out that it did. But there had been kind of no effort made to include them in the conversation. And that's actually like one of the things that people try to address is the fact that so for so long, especially around conversations of gender, they weren't actually including everyone in the community. Like not even including all the women in the community. They were just, you know, some playwrights who went to the same university talking to each other. And to try to make it so like everybody who has like some skin in the game has a 
seat at that table. So I think that's important. I think it's also um, important to look at how so much of the theater is connected. Like reviews are not isolated from the rest of the like press machine of a show and kind of the rest of the way a show is talked about. And that you have to address it not just when like the one big thing happens, but kind of address all the little things that play into it. Like I think something that really does affect how work by women is talked about that seems much more subtle and something that comes up in reviews or in interviews a lot that we do is women saying like, I never get asked about process. I get asked about being a woman, but I never get asked about process. Like I never get asked, how do I write? What are my, um, like what influences me? None of those questions that men get asked. Well, white men get asked. Um, and I think to kind of start to look at like having every little bit of press, there is a difference. And that it kind of squashes individualism um, and treats people like they're a group. And I think the more you treat people as a group, you're treating them as an abstract. And I think that makes it easier for something to not go address. Um, which is why sometimes when there is a big specific issue, it's easier because it's like an actual concrete object rather than some abstract thing of like, oh, the women. Um, so again, it's like not really answering the question, but I do think there are some things to be aware of when attempting to answer it that it would help if they got it more. I think it depends on what kind of conversation you want to have. Because there's, there's a difference between the conversation where I want to call someone out um, on their bigotry or um, I want to make something known to the public, um, to the masses about something. Um, and there's a really big difference between that sort of conversation um, and I have noticed um, something in a call of a colleague and I want them to fix it. And um, uh, like um, if, um, if Jessica has something wrong with her, I'm there, hurry. Um, um, but like, um, and um, I notice that she's acting in a certain way um, that, that, um, uh, that I think is offensive or something. I'm gonna take her um, to the side and we're gonna build a cone of silence, you know? And we're gonna have an intimate conversation about it. And I think that's the way to make the biggest change. You really wanna change something, take someone aside, um, buy them a drink, you know, get to know them. I mean, like, it's interesting what you, you talk about in terms of the clicks in the theater, because I don't think of it as clicks, but what I do think of it um, is a, it's a word I used just earlier, cone of silences. There are so many cone of silences. Like, I would not have a conversation with just anyone about that play. I just won't do it, you know? It, I do not have that luxury in my job, um, because theater people gossip, we all gossip, and we're all gonna talk to someone else. So I don't know who you're gonna to talk to, so I talk about certain things among certain people, and I'm not so loosey-goosey that I'm going to give my opinion uh, you know, flippantly. Um, it does make it difficult to have real conversations. I have one, it's super quick. Um, but just the other thing, kind of going off of what you were saying, is also I think it can be helpful if you try to frame things in a positive way, and also like, some sort of positive solution rather than just saying, I mean, I think it's important to point out what you're saying is wrong, but I've noticed a lot of times with women, people are very gung-ho with being like, oh, sexism bad, but that actually doesn't necessarily mean that they support women. And I think sometimes it's equally important to be like, hey, theater company, you've gone two seasons now where you've had no women to also be like, hey, you know who I think is really great? Like, I love like X, Playwright, and you should produce her. Like that sort of thing, I think is like equally, yeah, definitely equally important, if not more so, than just pointing out what's wrong, because it gives like an actual solution and something people can do about it. This is hopefully an easy solution, and not talk a lot to somebody else. Yeah, I think you bring up a good uh, uh, point in terms of how we talk about sensitive subject matter and what are, what's the role of personal responsibility and professional responsibility. And when is it responsible to have a private conversation? And when is it responsible to have a public conversation? Because it's just that important. And it's not always easy to know what the difference is. Well, to, to, the, to the issue of, of what we think of shows, I'll just say, for anybody who follows me on social media, I have a lot of Twitter followers, and I'm very reasonable amount of Facebook friends, most of whom I don't know. Um, I never say what I think of shows. I don't say good, I don't say bad, I don't talk about them. I tell people what I see or what I'm going to, but like it or not, because I've just decided there's plenty of people saying what they think of shows, and I don't 
I just don't feel compelled to tell everybody whether or not I liked something or not. But coming back to what Deep said that I've asked about the conversation, I look at my right, I mean, I can't possibly get in a room with enough people to really affect a broad conversation. That's why I write. My writing can reach more people than I can ever possibly talk to. And I'll just say that the most gratifying thing from my writing is when I hear from teachers, professors, saying, I use this in my class, or thank you, you just gave me material for next week's class. Because a textbook can't keep up, and sometimes there needs to be something to respond to, and whether they're responding to Laura, or to Victoria, or to any, or to Deep, or anyone they may read, it's a starting place for conversations that we would not be able to make happen no matter, you know, unless we were incredibly famous and influential individuals in the world. So we can have an effect by putting our voices out there in a way. And I think it's it's probably true that we have affected conversations and we'll never know about the conversations. Affected. So I don't have to physically be there, but I'm, 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 I may end up part of it. And that's that's what I'm writing for, is just for maybe somebody's going to read it, maybe somebody's going to share it. And yeah, all that social media stuff of seeing how many likes, how many shares, and how many comments. And, and on my Facebook page, I do still take the attitude of, as long as the conversation is respectful, I have no problem with differences of opinion. Even when people tell me they don't like what I wrote, it's only when people <coughs> start with that hominem attacks uh, that, that that's when I step in and say, wait a minute, my page, my rules. Right, no, the, like what you said, how it just reminded me of um, what Victoria said earlier, which is it's easier to share something when it's like, an essay or something that's really thoroughly written because then it's just like a shorthand. It, it's, it's easier to get your point across, and I think so many of these conversations we've been having about like the Mikado or about like Big River, it started from a piece of writing which then became an instigator for a conversation. So speaking of Mikado and Big River, I wanted to talk about classics and when we are we when we're representing problematic works to a modern audience, and what obligations do presenters have to their audience, or do they have any obligation to recontextualize it, or is it just like a timepiece that just stands on its own? Hi, good evening, Thanks for having me. I have a couple thoughts on that. One, when we were on the tour of uh, the Northwest production of Big River, we went to Houston and performed in the outdoor park. It was free to the public. And the mayor of Houston asked, he didn't demand, but he asked that we take all of the Edwards out of production because there were people who'd be walking through the park who didn't know the context and didn't know what was going on and felt that there was some responsibility there. Um, I look at shows like Showboat, um, and they place in uh, the Extreme Musical Theater, but I also look at the original text of the opening of that show. No one does the original text of that show before. And I think that many people would have a problem if you don't know the opening song or the colored folk was from the Mississippi. Well, the original lyric was not colored folk. And no one does that anymore because there is an understanding of how that's going to be received in the world in which we're living today. So I just go with these pieces that are historical or uh, based on some a time in our history, that there, I'm not saying they shouldn't be done. I have a choice of whether I go to see them or not. But I feel like we're missing a valuable opportunity to come together and have a conversation about it. Um, and so easy, it's so easy with social media, people just to throw things out there and to spew things with no responsibility for it. And I feel like what's been great about this experience is the, uh, the experience that happened with the Big River Review. 
actually was a big part of why we're why I'm sitting here now. So I think when we have an opportunity, it's much harder to look someone in the face and say some of the things that we say in writing. So I think the more opportunities we can have to have conversation where we can actually look someone in the face and have to own and have accountability for what we say, I think those are the opportunities that I'm looking for and want a whole different uh, thing. But um, I do feel that with historical pieces, we should have some responsibility for the stuff that we you know, it's not just Big River and Show Up, you know, which are two um, musicals by where I get confused constantly. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, but like it's um, Merchant of Venice. Uh, that's a lot of Shakespeare. Um, but um, take Merchant of Venice. You can produce Merchant of Venice and just be like, hey, it's Merchant of Venice. Um, and that's fine to do, but people will say things about it because it's a really freaking anti Semitic show. You can't draw the anti Semitism out of Merchant of Venice. Every other line is dirty youth. You know, I mean, like, um, uh, it, um, but like um, the public theater, we did the first of Venice uh, five or six years ago. Um, and instead of leaning away from it, we actually leaned into it and showed the, the anti-Semitism at, uh, anti at the heart of this piece and what it did to the world. I think that you can produce any classic piece if you want. You just have to take responsibility for what happens afterwards. It's like there's no censorship. Um, uh, you can you can deliver a speech that's you know horrible and sexist, or you can you know make a play that's really really racist. You're just gonna have to deal with it after. Do you like program to your dumbest audience member or your smartest? <laughs> no, but it's like I got a show the other day and I had the feeling like I'm, I thought it was an interesting piece, but it was something where I felt like I was probably more knowledgeable about than your average audience member. And there was a part of me that was like, oh god, there are some people who are going to come see this play and going to walk away with like strange ideas. I have a really short answer. We don't program to our audience. So. <laughs> Yeah, to, to, uh, this is a bigger question, but you know, in, in terms of responsibility, and, that, and this is a big question asked of literary managers produced all the time, it's like, you know, are you catering to your audience, or are you trying to lead a conversation with your audience, or respond to artist impulses, and, and identify things that are really cool and someone's really passionate about that you want to share. I mean, all of those things are at play, and I think it's a completely um, legitimate question. We should probably open it up to get some audience questions. Um, we started a little bit late, so I'm just going to ask your indulgence that maybe we go to 8.10, and I promise to end there. Um, does anyone have some questions that they want to ask any of our panelists? I'll repeat what we said just so we can catch it. Cool. Um, so we're in a season of when a lot of theaters start announcing their seasons, right? And so we look at some seasons, and there's uh, a lot of different things happening. I've been seeing a little bit of a trend in New York and some of the regionals of all white playwrights and all white, white directors, or also the, the playwrights of color being put in a second stage, or uh, sometimes one master playwright of color in the main stage and then uh, all white season otherwise. But a lot of these theaters are doing really well with gender parity this, this season specifically. So I guess my question is this, when you're dealing with all these different things like gender and race and disability and whatnot, like how do you choose which foot to lead with? Like are you responsible for all of them all the time? Are you responsible for some of them sometimes, other of them at other times? Like how do you choose? Let me just uh, recap that quickly for folks who are watching the live, live stream. It's the question about programming and trying to find um, you know, some, some equity in programming and whose stories are you telling? And because we live in a culture that is, you know, where the, the white male still has a bunch of privilege, um, and when something is unspecified, is there an assumption that that goes to the, the position of privilege? Um, how are theaters programming? Are they consciously programming? Are they trying to achieve um, equity and a good representation of voices? Is there marginalization going on in terms of what stories are told on what stages? And um, you know what's our responsibility in, in responding to it, either in writing about it, calling it out, or when we have a voice uh, in the room to try to you know pitch something or call out like where are we finding the balance, either in a given season or over the course of a few seasons. And also, how do we prioritize what we call out? Because it's one piece has gender parity, but it's not racially diverse. Do <coughs> we get pissed off about that, or do we just head like head your bets? <laughs> what a sticky question. Um, uh, I'll just say what's on my mind. I think that if you find 
yourself in that situation, there's a problem. You know, if you're choosing um, uh, to throw one group under the, um, the bus because um, uh, um, another group, you know, because you want to satisfy them, you have a problem, you know, and you actually need to back it on up. Um, and I would actually estimate, and I think this is the problem with um, New York City theater, so I think just the problem with theater um, in general, is that if you're scrambling, you're like, oh, we need a woman, we need an, an Asian female play right here, and then you know, um, your staff is um, messed up. You know, there's something <laughs> wrong with your staff. I'm guessing that your staff is all white. Um, um, and because if your staff um, is diverse in terms of gender and race and ethnicity and sexuality and stuff like that, you will naturally come to equality in terms of your season planning. Look at the staffs of these theater, look who runs these theater, and then look at what they're programming. The fish rock from the head. Oh, oh T has a response. I just wanted to add to that. Um, I also think that people think of like gender parity or racial equity or all of these things like as a, like, a one-time goal. Like if we did this thing and now we're good forever. It's not a one-time goal. Like you need to do it consistently. So if you have gender parity in one season, awesome. The next season have racial equity. The next season have a little bit of both. The next season don't program any white dudes. So just it needs to be a long-term goal and you're never going to reach it. <laughs> But that's okay, because diversity is ever evolving. So, but yeah. I but, think we're also yeah. bringing up the, the question of what's conscious and what's unconscious. Um, you know, as Jesse brought up, if you have a very homogeneous staff, you're not going to ask certain questions because it's not part of your lived experience. If you have a diverse staff or a lot of different voices, and hopefully people who argue <laughs> with one another because they're coming from different places. That's just naturally going to come up. You're not going to. I mean, what happens when you start to indulge in the in the tokenism game um, usually comes from quote unquote ally overcompensation. Um, yeah, but it's asking, well, no, 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 to raise the question, but I think it's it's more that um, you know looking at staff composition. I think it's a challenge for a lot of organizations, particularly in the theater or programming. Some organizations have made a conscious choice to diversify the staff, and particularly when you have a staff that's big enough. Um, hopefully you can do that in success of hiring to diversify when you have a really small staff, or, and when people stick around an organization a long time, um, that's harder to do, and then you, know, you get voices from the outside and you're trying to program. Um, and I think everyone's grappling with it, but uh, more people are grappling with it because it's been called to question. One little thing is I feel like there have been some studies that show that actually just having, just to talk about the gender issue, because that's kind of what I'm most well versed in, that just putting women on the staff doesn't mean that they're going to choose plays by women or about women. Um, and that has actually been backed up. Um, some of the reasoning behind that is because they think the plays, um, they've been told that like the plays will be not as well received, and then they'll lose their job, things like that. Um, and a million kind of other reasons in terms of how sexism works in our society. So I do think it is more complicated than just to put women on your staff. I mean, I think you should absolutely be doing that, but also acknowledging that um, sexism runs so much deeper than that, and women can be sexist too, or they can at least respond to something because there's so much kind of internalized sexism in society in a way that's still not necessarily going to help women. Um, and I think that's important to point that out. I also think in terms of like the check box thing that Jackie was talking about, I'm like, oh, let's get a this and let's get a that, that there's a way in which how we're having these conversations can actually, I think, be making that potentially worse because I think especially for actually the people who are supposed to be trying to help. Like there's this thing called stereotype, um, the stereotype threat, which I don't know if people have heard about. It's a thing in education. Um, and I went to an all-girls school that did a lot of research about how kind of girls learn best. Um, and they still do a lot. And one of the things they talk about is the stereotype threat, which is basically like, because there's a perception that girls are not as good at math, they are treated like they're not as good as math, and therefore they are not as good at math. Um, but the other thing that they found was when they're doing standardized tests, is they ask, before the girls took the test, they asked them to like do um, one of those sheets where it's like, what is your gender? 
But as soon as they have to like, identify themselves as a woman, their scores went down. And I wonder a little bit about how that affects the society at large when we're having all these conversations about how women are treated fairly, if some of that comes into play too. Which is just, I mean, I have no idea, but I think it's an interesting question to raise. Uh, yes. Growing up, I grew up in a suburb outside of Cleveland, Ohio. 
I went to see every tour that came through, every symphony, they, it was all free. We never had to pay for it. You know, and that was a part of why I love the arts today. It was because I was exposed to a young age to everything. And those opportunities were there. So I think if we're not if we're gonna be losing it, God forbid, in more of our, you know, on a national level, then it's you know the producer's responsibility to make sure that there's another generation of, of theater goers that are up and coming and being kind of raised on what's out there so that, that when they become ticket paying adults, they can still come back.
And non-for-profit theaters also program plays, and people don't go see the plays they're not interested in. It's, it, it, I think everyone's sort of viewing it that, that a similar kind of thing. Just kind of one, and I know we're throwing some hands in the back of the short, but I do think that the audiences is like also to keep in mind, you can't punish the people who show up. And it's sort of about finding a balance, and especially in this country where we have next to no public funding for the arts. Um, like you do need people to pay full price for a ticket. Like you need them. Um, and you need people who subscribe, and you need people who give money. Um, so I do think like there was um, an essay in New York Magazine that Jesse Green wrote, who I think, by the way, is like a really good critic. Um, and it was right after the whole thing of Hamilton happened, the Mike Pence thing when Hamilton happened, and the whole like safe spaces conversation. And he wrote this thing where he was talking about, you know, for him as a gay man, the theater was one of kind of the only places that he could go with his partner and be publicly affectionate. Like for them, it was a big space in that way. And I think to kind of keep in mind that there are people who feel that like the theater is, like that that's part of the reason why people are showing up and not kind of grow the baby out of the bathwater is important too, because you want it to bring in new people, but you can't actually afford to lose all the old either. Big challenge for producers, no matter under what model they are producing. I want to take one more question in the back, and then close out. Well, I have a question. I want to ask, um, I guess, what are ways to, uh, to diversify uh, mainstream publications? Because um, um, there's, a, there's there are old conversations that happen because mainstream publications are sending reviews out to see shows, um, especially by writers of color and the critics that will frame a reference. For these, for these work that they're going to see. Um, a few years ago, there was a big controversy um, in the black theater community when the New York Times sent someone to review uh, the leading more so some, um, uh, Detroit 67. And the critic, the only frame of reference he had for African American culture was Good Times. And it was very problematic. And the black theater community, I know people were really living, but uh, that was like four or five four years ago. And, his, and in 2017, the same refer, you know, the, the, the same issue refers. So I, I just want to hear people's thoughts about how to get or how to diversify these um, major publications so that there are higher critics of color because um, I remember Barbara Jefferson was one of I don't know if she was the last black woman to work at New York Times, you know, the cultural critic, where are where are these organizations get, you know, how can they how, how can they develop a core of critics who know what they're talking about? Um, let me just, I think you were talking a little softly, so I just want to, to recap this. I think this is a great last question to end on since we started talking about um, reviewers. Is uh, what's the responsibility of mainstream publications to also hire diversely as we've talked about, but also what's the, what's the responsibility of a theater reviewer to get the <coughs> context with which to review a given show? Is this a problem for those of you who work in journalism? I mean, I think a problem with the New York Times is that you have two key critics who are also incredibly mediocre. Um, All right. <laughs> well, historically, for the last, that you know, both Brantley and Richard Wood, they work at the New York Times. I'm not actually convinced that they like read the other section. Um. So all for that, out there. Okay, that's just that. Let's have more, more responses to the question. I think the same systemic problem that exists in the theater exists in journalism. And there's no question that um, we need more journalists of color, we need more critics of color. Um, how that happens within each of those institutions is also the same way uh, the arts are thinking about what they're putting on their stages. If those organizations want to become, remain relevant and generate ad revenue so that people can, by like creating content that people want to view, then hopefully they'll evolve in that direction.
direction. The issue of how quickly the staff change, their unions uh, involved, it's a difficult situation. Certainly the job description that's out now for the second string critic position of the New York Times is, is very broad and it asks people to write in and talk about how they might approach um, criticism and what their viewpoint is. It's not simply send us your clips. What that's going to result in, it's impossible for us to say, and I don't think any of us on this panel have, have the ability or the authority to make those decisions except to say that in the case of newspapers, in the case of, in the, case of the media, it is a market-driven imperative uh, as well as hopefully uh, a, a practical and ethical one as they look to the future and their ability to influence things. Um, so, yeah, it's a challenge. I mean, there's relatively few critics, uh, theater critics of color around the country. There are some, but there's not a lot. Um, even gender diversity is important. Yeah. Right, it doesn't even, well, I'm sorry, go ahead and say it. Well, as Laura just said, the, the, the theater uh, job description uh, doesn't even necessarily require a theater background, which uh, people can feel a lot of what it's about. Um, or a child question. Yeah. You can no, keep saying that. <laughs> I don't want to be the, the guy <laughs> holding the <laughs> 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 But I think, you know, I think it, it's a challenge. And again, you know, some of what we've been talking about uh, with people who use the phrase check boxes and people who use, you know, but we're, we're talking about, uh, in there, we're talking about intersectionality. It's very difficult when you have a singular critical voice on any given review to necessarily represent all of the people who may consume that review and their perspectives. Hopefully, there are voices that are intelligent, attuned, uh, and, and well-versed enough to, to provide opinions. But unfortunately, we're also at a time when the number of critical voices is continuing to dwindle, which on the one hand places more authority on those who remain. On the other hand, it makes it harder and harder to have, have diversity of opinion. It's a, it's, it's a challenge um, at a time when journalism is diminishing to, uh, to ask for more voices. But that's where um, there's also the question of what's going to be self-generated um, by people who may establish their voices through other means. Um, and, and hopefully, uh, we're going to find our way to that. In some cases, we're actually seeing theaters sponsor in-house journalism, which is independent in, uh, in many degrees. They're not reviewing, but they're certainly writing about the arts not only of their own theater, but in their own communities. We're going to have to find new solutions in order to allow there to be voices. Quick, quick time. You want to give a quick comment? Yeah. I'll be really quick. The only thing that I'll say is that, like, I think, um, I think that uh, segregation is like the actual the, the problem in everything. Everything I can trace back to um, segregation, and in all walks of life, you know, um, if you are in Give money to publications you support because so publications are draining in money right now. Luckily, with Trump, they're gaining the money for political reporters, but ours is the first thing that gets cut when there's a budget cut. So give money to publications with the higher writers that you like. Give money to independent publications like the Interval. Do you, do you, oh, do you, do you guys not give money? We don't take money. We don't take okay, never mind. Don't give them don't money. Give us money. <laughs> but give money to places that you like, and then write into publications who don't have a critic. Say, I want a critic, and I know all of these other people do too. Like write a letter. Like be active and tell people what you want. Like they will listen because it's a it's a bottom line. Bottom line. Uh, and speaking of giving money, the, the Castillo Theater and the All-Stars Project um, entered the Mexican space for free tonight. Um, and if you don't know the, know the work that they've done, please look them up. Um, at allstars.org, they produce theater for the whole city. The programming is extensive and amazing. Um, I know that 
much to network for a really long time. So thank you to the Skill Theater and the All Stars Project for having us here. Um, and thank you to uh, Michael and Jesse and Victoria and Howard and Laura and my collaborator, Steve Tran, for um, engaging in this conversation that we wanted to have a timely conversation. So thank you for jumping in. Um, it's a huge topic. We hope this is the first of more conversations to keep engaging in um, conversations that are sometimes hard to have, but we must not stay segregated and um, continue to have that. And thank you all for um, coming out here uh, tonight when it's cold, and thank you all for um, streaming um, and, and watching us or, or watching us archive. So um, stay in contact uh, with us at uh, lnta.org, and um, just thanks again. Hands everyone, please.